Uh, thank you for coming, and I'm Robert Thibodeau, and um, it's all true, everything you've heard. And as I was telling a friend of mine that was here, there's a lot of really good friends that have been you know, trying to study stuff with me, and it's, um, it's really a great honor to share your studies, because I really, I'm in, entering into a topic that is so vast, and uh, when I was asked if I wanted to give a talk here, I thought of you know things that I like to talk about, like astrology and different subjects. And for some reason, when I went to talk, it just went Sophia, just jumped out of my mouth. And then I went, oh, wait a minute, you know. And I thought, well, that'd be easy. And so, so then I I went back and studied um, a very difficult book. I have a friend that I was talking to today that just was with Christopher Bamford, and uh, and. And a few years back, he and I were with Prokofiev, the son of the composer who's the head of the Russian Anthroposophical Society. And Bamford's the chief uh, translator of Rudolf Steiner books. And um, along with the guy who runs, Gene, who runs the Steiner Press. And so we were conversing. And this, other, this guy I was talking to today, he just wrote a book on Sophia that I haven't seen. And it's not out yet. And in having a short conversation with him, um, he came right to the point of where I got stuck a few weeks back on who is Sophia and how can there be so many goddesses and where does she fit in the scheme of the theosophical or Rosicrucian theosophy scheme of the seven earths and, each, and we're in the fourth earth and each earth has seven stages and each of those has seven. And so this third set of seven, of which we, some people think we're about to enter the Aquarian Age, uh, and these are 2100 year, year, approximately, years of time, and that, and that there are many people who think that we're, that the Old Testament is kind of like the school of the Father, and then we have for 2,000 years, hi, I just noticed you're, <laughs> the school of, the school of, um, the sun and the intellect and the mind of um, the might, maybe the mind of God you might say or the mind of of what God's representing and that would be the, the age of the Christ or the Christos or the Krishna um, or what I what I like is the age of Hermes Hermes instead of saying Jesus you know you could say if you read the Secret Doctrine by Blavatsky you can see um, Bacchus, the higher Dionysius, and and when when you specifically when you look at Bacchus and Dionysius, uh, who are thought of by the modern intellect as uh, drunken gods uh, that accidentally hurt people, and and for sure if you get possessed by your higher self, um, if you're possessed by your high Atma Buddha. Uh, you're possessed by the Holy Spirit. See, the ideas that we're entering in at around 2100 or even before, the age of the Holy Spirit, and this is a lot of people's thinking, and they all debate exactly when the Aquarian age starts. They debate if we're really going toward an age of the Holy Spirit and an age of revelation and shocking changes because a sudden truth dawn upon us. And these are big questions. And when I was talking to my friend today, and he was just at this meeting with people who are very studious, you know, intellectual, people that I'd be terrified if they were in the audience who have written books on this stuff. Um, they got stuck right where I was stuck. Like, where is Sophia? And you, the Theosophical Society is the word Theosophia, Theosophical. And out of the Theosophical Society started by a woman, Blavatsky, who later Gandhi reads and Martin Luther King Jr. reads because she read it and Einstein's reading it and I read, I met Einstein's daughter and she told me, I said, is, is it really true that Einstein read Blavatsky and she said um, it was open and heavily underlined on his desk, if that tells you, when he died. It was open and heavily underlined. And so we could go on. Alice Bailey, you know, who influenced David Spangler a lot and later I would turn David Spangler and William Irwin Thompson on to Rudolf Steiner and 
you know, Rudolf Steiner comes out of the theosophical movement, and it's, it's Sophia ties into this. So when you have Theosophia, you have the idea of Theo is theology or God, and then you have Sophia, which is wisdom, and Theosophy is the wisdom of God. When, but to read the secret doctrine is a very tough thing, and to read Prokofiev's The Heavenly Sophia, if you really want uh, a book that talks about Sophia really well. Sophia, who is Sophia? Let's just, ju let's just jump into it then, because if we, if we were just talking at my bookstore, or as many of you know, we just have short conversations. I mean, I never have t enough time with Troy, who I'm ever thankful for recording these and helping me with the internet. I never have t enough time with him. Now, Prokofiev in his book makes a very strong statement that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is not Sophia. And uh, he's very critical of fellow researchers like Robert Powell and uh, others who have spoken of a triangle of Father, Son, Holy Spirit and another triangle of Mother, you know, the triple goddesses, the young, lusty, youthful one, and the Mother, Demeter, if you want, and the old crone who has wisdom. And so a lot of people will say there's another trinity. But I'm proposing for practical research, and in the secret doctrine, uh, hopefully I'll get to that note, Blavatsky clearly says that the Holy Spirit is the Holy Sophia and the feminine spirit of God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Steiner in his early books, printed, just reprinted for, that we saw at Mayflower in Australia, uh, can't quite remember, awareness, form, and life so that there's life and there's form. And there's an awareness that arises between. Now those of you who have been following my line of thought is that I'm really of the opinion that each of us is three people, if not seven. And what, one part of us is connected to all of life and the great mater or mother. And the other part of us is a selfless, pure spirit and you take the cue from the Gospels where Jesus says, I go to the Father in secret or silence. So that there's a part of us inside that is total emptiness, like the Tibetans would talk about, emptiness. And so we have a physical, emotional, and mental, and we have uh, something inside of us that is an ego that's either caught up with the physical, emotional, and mental, bound in bondage, slavery, habits, addictions, with the physical, emotional, and mental. And then we go into higher soul realms of thinking, feeling, and willing, or light, consciousness, pictures, light streams, source of the nervous, optic nerve, beyond that, light, breath, gives wings to the heart when you breathe into your heart, and there's a whole thing in that. And then we have uh, the will um, of the mystery of blood and fire and sexuality and digestion and impulses of will. And then the idea is when the, in theosophy the idea is when the Kama Rupa or the lower, they call the lower, in the long run there's no low and high, but temporarily, there's definitely a right and wrong and good and bad. In the long run, it's all going to get worked out, but it might take a while. So there is kind of like a lower self that can trick you and stuff. So then when the, the desire mind or fear mind gets into like taking over, then the will goes into desire and fear, right? And, but the higher will is orchestrated from this, both the stillness and your relationship to everything. And when it's all said and done, if I was giving you the end of the talk, I would tell you that really it is about this oneness, that you're one with everything or you understand the oneness, and this spiritual influx of enlivening the world around us, that we can enliven and spiritualize and give leaven and levity or, or depth to the world around us, so we can somehow make the world around us better. I might be able to remove myself from one or two of you if you don't like me or I don't like you, but inevitably we can't, and that the whole world is uh, you know, from a spiritual point of view, everything that comes from outside of you is the material world of the past, I mean, the past coming back at you. We can see it with the stars, that the stars are distant and 
they're light of millions of years old and the light's coming. And you look at the stars and you go, those stars may not be there now. That's a light from millions of years old, right? But it's not harder to see that everything outside of you is the past too coming at you because it's so close. And then you have the inside, how we deal with the inside, and only you know what the inside's doing. And the inside in purifying, intelligizing, illuminating, aspiring, when the inside gets enlightened, then that can change the future because the future comes from the dark. This might complicate you, but those of you who've been keeping up with me will follow it very clearly. So you have the outside is a relationship to the great mater, matter, mother. Mater, mother. The inside is I go to the father in secret, and the father is just beyond everything, beyond thought and thinking and feeling, and it's beyond any kind of thing we have going. Our feelings, the, the middle way of Buddha is the heart that is like where Jesus is crucified between the two. And this is something that I've been saying for years and years, so a lot of you might even be bored with that because that's part of what I've been as part of the runway that has brought me to where I am. But you can turn this completely around, too, because the great mother and the great father, just like you have a mother and father, we have to be born out of a mother and father. In Chartres Cathedral, you walk into all the great cathedrals, and there's two giant pillars. And one's the sun and one's the moon. In Chartres, they actually just tell you straight out, one's the sun and one's the moon. And there's measurements that are exact that prove that it is. And the differentiation of the towers is that the moon is that many days and that many, it's like exact. And then and you can see that, we talk about that in The Secret of the Cathedrals on YouTube. And then you, and you have these three doors, you know? You have the right and left, but you walk through the middle doors. And, the, and it's like this vesica Pisces. It's like this, where two circles meet, you have this, you know, the, the shape of the eye or the womb or the wound on Christ's hands. You know, Steiner says every wound is the womb of a new super sensible sense organ. And uh, in Jungian psychology of Marion Woodman, uh, the wound has to become the womb of the second birth. In the long run, this is how it kind of it works. But when you enter the cathedral, you are, there's a right and left path, you know, there's good and bad, <laughs> light and dark. There's, you know, there's monarchism and the, the struggle between freeing the light that's, there's a whole rap about the Zoroastrians and monarchism and the light that's captured by the darkness inside of us. And then you enter the cathedral, and I'm saying that there's, you, when you enter these cathedrals with that kind of archway, that if you were to go underground, you'd see the rest of it, or it's implied, that you're walking through the center of the eye of a needle, in a way. And that you walk through and you walk into Chartres and they have these labyrinths where the minotaur, animal, something, human, is down there and you go through this labyrinth. And uh, if you can get past the birth mysteries and the complications of your thinking and feeling, then you can get to the center of the church. And it's my belief that the Templars actually um, made it so that you get to the, to the church and you walk in these two cathedrals of sun and moon and you walk through the center door and you get up to the center. Now, they killed the Templars and the grail guys come along and they teach that there's this holy grail and if you can find the grail it nourishes everyone and every night is on their own and you have to enter the forest at your own place and you have to find the way to do it and it starts representing Dante's Dante when he's getting past those three animals and he's entering into this wilderness craziness and the, there's a wasteland in the grail mysteries there's a wasteland and that the earth mother is no longer present and the grail knights have to go out and get, try to find the grail because the grail will heal the king and the king's wounded and our ego is wounded somehow and we took it personally what happened to our parents and ever since we got kicked out of heaven and then the Garden of Eden and then my mother's womb and then she left me or he, whatever happened. I lost my job. They tried to cut off my leg. They want to take off my, yep. Yeah. You know, people are going through this right and left. And, and yet, we're, we still survive. We're like in, in the Bhagavad Gita, you can neither slay nor be slain of the spiritual soul. So the, the Grail Knights are looking for the Grail, and then they get in trouble because they're, the Templars built in 150 years or something, tons of cathedrals. And the Templars were like the ultimate crusaders. They went and learned from the Moors, and they learned from everybody. They were accused of making peace treaties with everybody. And they built all these cathedrals, 
And then they, they killed the Templars um, because they were teaching that every one of you is equal to every other one. And, the, and the, the slogan of the Templars was, each of us is our own pope and king. The church and the king thought that many of us should be economic slaves that Abraham Lincoln warned about and Ben Franklin. The dangers of economic servitude, voluntary. But there's huge problems where uh, the church realizes and the kings that you can kill the rich Templars and you can kill the rich Cathars at South France, Eleanor of Aquitaine, a name that when I first heard, my whole body freaked out. I must have known her. Eleanor of Aquitaine, the troubadours. And women were very powerful in southern France, the Cathars. And, and they, they, you know, they couldn't get anybody to kill them. They wanted to steal their land. <laughs> Philip Le Bel, Philip the Fair, the king of, England, of France, seduced the pope into like announcing they had to kill him. They're going to get their land. They're very wealthy. They had prime land in Provence. And nobody wanted to do it. So they went to England and Germany and got like hired guns. Like, you know, we could do in Afghanistan, the Ram, you know. And they get these troopers to come over and they say, if you come, we're going to give you land. You can steal, rape, do whatever you want. We'll give you land too. And then they kill them all off. So then the Grail guys get taken out because they're doing, they figured out that they have this cup and the cup is like, you know, what's the cup? You know, it's a cup of the heart really, but it's the cup of the chalice of, your, of the womb. It's the cup of the skull cup or the skull cap. It's the cup of your head. It's the cup of your heart. It's a triple cup. It's like Caridwen has a triple womb, thinking, feeling, and willing. And she like is only obedient, obedient to the universal truths and doesn't get caught up in other stuff. So after the Grail guys are done, the troubadours are running around declaring they're in love with everybody. And so they would like sing songs about your higher self. And they sing songs about your beautiful qualities and they wouldn't look at your ugly qualities. And in other words, what we do in modern times is we meet each other's angel, fall in love with it, and then we meet what each of us has to work on. And in Jungian psychology, we become boxers of the shadow, boxers, and we try to point out to the other person what they need to do to fix, rather than Robert telling himself what he should be fixing in himself, that he could become a Buddha and make everybody really like him and get invited to all the parties. <laughs> By the way, if you were a Grail Knight, you had to be usually a fighter of some sort, but you could be a smart guy that's a Grail Knight. Or if you were a troubadour and you played really cool songs, you get invited to the big parties. And that was the big thing, is that you could write a poem or be a romantic poet of the 1800s, like Keats and Shelley and all these guys. You could do certain things that would make you so popular as Philip Knight. I told myself I wasn't going to mention his name again. As Philip Knight, when he was my great spiritual mentor of mine when I began. And as he said, uh, if you'll just read six or seven books I point out to you, Robert, you could become a genius and you might get enlightened. I can't promise it to you, but it's possible. But I can promise you one thing. If you'll read six or seven books, because it's not like the book is going to give you something new, it's that it's going to give you the vocabulary for expressing what's already in the treasure chest. And if you're willing to read six or seven books, I can't guarantee that he's 89 and I'm 19 or something. I can't guarantee that you're going to become a genius or get enlightenment. It's possible. But I can guarantee this, ladies and gentlemen, and I now guarantee it to you like he guaranteed it to me. Because I'm living proof that when, if you'll read six or seven of those books, people will want to buy you dinner. You'll get free dinners. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'm offering you free dinners tonight at the Theosophical Society. They haven't offered that for a long time. The grail was something that would nourish everyone wherever you needed it so you could do whatever you wanted to do. So when they kill the troubadours, troubadours are invited to all the parties, man. They're like, they're like rock stars. And they, and they do poetry and they sing about your higher self. And yes, some of them made a mistake and they touched the breast or they got, they got involved. Some of them lost their lives for this. But, and, but the, later when they kill the troubadours, they completely destroy all the evidence. They burned all the Cathar books. You can't find any of them in what their teachings are. It's really hard. Usually when you find a book on the Cathars, it's some hippie living in Glastonbury. So then the troubadours get killed because they're teaching that every one of you has a divine, beautiful love and truth within you. And that can't happen. Then the Rosicrucians appear. 
And they, and I think the troubadours, they had it before. You go to the center of the church, you walk in the church. Oh, hi, I just saw you. The, some people are here and I didn't even see them yet. Some people are pretty good at hiding. Um, so you come in the church between the two, the two, well, let's get to it. It's Our Lady the Church, Our Lady of Chartres, Our Lady of the Mother Lord, the Mother Lodge, the Mother Church. And so you walk between the legs into the womb of the church, into the temple. These are all symbolic. Blavatsky is the quickest in the secret doctrine, that third volume, mysterious volume especially, to say that the sexual act is, is, is if you do it materialistically, it's, just, it's temporal, but it's symbolic of something. And it's symbolic of spiritual truth. So you walk into the temple, we all have to get born. As I say in my poetry book, without sex, none of us would be here. Without love, none of us would stay. As you get older, it's the minds that meet. But it's the hearts that meet that keep us young. If we stay in our minds and have everything perfectly figured out, you'll get old quick. The Arthurian Grail mysteries uh, have a lot to do with the sun and is Arthur, the art of Thor. And Arthur is like the Christ or with the 12 apostles. He's got the 12, or Jason and the Argonauts, the 12 Argonauts, or Ulysses and his fellows. Uh, you have Arthur and the 12 knights, and you have these 12 nerve plexuses in the head. And so in a large way, it is the uh, light. In Tibetan Buddhism, they would say it's the father's 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 sperm, which is really light, and it comes through the top of the head and descends. Then the earth spins, and the earth is the mother mysteries. And the earth spins and comes up in a triangular portion. portion. And when you're looking at it, it's like a triangle. And so you have through the blood, the warmth of the blood, you have the mother mysteries. And Arthur is the 12, uh, uh, this, this impulse toward um, protecting women, making peace in the land, getting rid of bad guys, humanizing people, t you know, teaching them to settle down, not fight. And the Arthurian mysteries are pretty rough. All these knights are always fighting. Then you have the Parsifal mysteries, which are really huge. And this is all around the starting around the 9th century, but the 12th, 11th, 12th, the Middle Ages. Is it called the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages? You could start when Hypatius killed, by the way. I have a song about Hypatius somewhere, but it doesn't do it justice. But in um, 410 or so, Hypatius stoned to death, and she's one of the most brilliant women ever. Could be very well that she is part of the stream that inculcates people like Joan of Arc, and then I take great liberties in saying this in my book, but that Blavatsky is a reincarnation of those two. And that, that's very possible, but, there, but it could, could just be one third of her. Um, so then you have the Parsifal mysteries that come up from below. And Parsifal is dull and dumb and shy and makes mistake after mistake and, um, and sees the, he, you know, he's, he's the widow's son, like Mani is in Monarchism. And, other widow's sons that some of you might be familiar with. And, and, and Parsifal stumbles upon the mystery slowly. And that is, it's a very difficult book. It would serve you to read uh, Kovacs' edition of Parsifal, or his couple, Is, is well, Isabel Wyatt. So that that becomes this, this, so we have this feminine mystery rising from the earth. And Misha Kushi's thing is that the earth spins, and, and, and then it's like this vortex and the sky spins, and when those vortexes meet, wherever they cross, you have the caduceus. And in this idea of the caduceus, I had great plans tonight, so I'm just going to brief you, and then we're going to get to a couple notes. In this caduceus, which Max Heindel was part of the Rosicrucian movement, and he was a student of Rudolf Steiner's in Germany, and when he came and wrote the uh, Cosmo Conception, he borrowed it from the esoteric notes of the Rudolf Steiner secret school. And, uh, and so then Rudolf Steiner thought that he had to release it to the public. And then Steiner wrote Outline of Cold Science for the public. But you can see here this idea of a rising and a falling. And you can see the great theosophical Rosicrucian path of the Saturn evolution when we're all warmth. And then this light comes in the sun. And then being, um, I'm sorry, we're, and we're going down like with the blue. And then the moon evolution, the past earth evolution. And then we come to a Mars. The, this, these are the two earth evolutions that we're on. And we're at the Mars evolution where everybody fights. 
and we're trying to get to the Mercury evolution or spiritual thinking and love. And then we can rise to the next Earth evolution. Uh, and we're kind of caught up in this war between passion and thinking as above, so below. And we're trying to find the Ankh at the center of the interlaced triangles as the image of the Theosophical Society's image, of their symbol that's behind you. That there's this Venus sign or Ankh where the circle touches the cube or the square and spirit and matter meet in this great idea of the interlaced triangles, which is a, the interlaced triangle is a six-pointed star, a hexagon, often associated with Sophia. Sophia is uh, actually is part of the Holy Spirit. Rudolf Steiner, in that book I mentioned earlier, Awareness, Life, and Form, you have life and form, but then you have awareness that comes out of the center. And the Holy Spirit, you have the Father Principle and you have the Holy Spirit as the great mother. But, you know, in real truth, once we're past the human and we go to the higher level, there is no male and female. These are just kind ways of expressing things so that we can have this idea of electromagnetic or uh, you might say it this way, whatever's higher than you, if we purify ourselves and we pray and we meditate and we're still, we can open our hearts and minds to a fecundative force that we're the chalice for. When we grow to that next higher level, um, we find ourselves teaching little ones or having kids or taking care of babies or people who are less fortunate, hospice or whatever. We're, there's people, anybody who knows less than us and suffers more are our students, our children. And those who know more than us, and every person has some quality, if you can discern, that has some wonderful quality that we could learn from. And they have other ones that we could learn not to do. So that, that's an idea. When the, the student is ready, the teacher appears. But in the way that I'm talking, when the student is ready, the teaching and the teacher is always present. And so that when you have, you grow up to another higher level, no matter what level you're at, like in the Kabbalah, when you grow up to the next higher level, this is like a Kabbalah too, um, you, you get that wherever you are, you, uh, the next higher level, we're the chalice for. So in the Grail legend, you come through the doors, you come through birth, you get caught up in the emotions and the labyrinth of thinking, you walk to the center of the cathedral, so imagine me standing with my arms, and you're walking up to the cathedral and you're right in the center. Up here where the third eye is, is the altar. When the really good cathedrals, they're all pretty much the same. You walk up to the center and you have this funny feeling, and you look off to the right and left and there's like these doorways to the north and south. You walked in the west and you're heading to the east with the altar. We're going east by the way of the west we came, and, we're, and we look to the right and left and there's doors and we look ahead and there's this altar, often up three steps, size of a coffin or two cubes. And there's like six candles on it and a cross in the center. Maybe. Maybe there's seven lights in. Maybe the cross is seven. And so you get this idea. You're standing here. And often, like when I visited St. Paul's Cathedral in Canterbury and every great cathedral in England and France, you get to this place, and you look up, and it goes way high. You can feel it. And, the, and, I even, and a lot of times, there's something on the ground that marks it, and nobody that studied the cathedral knows why that round thing is there. And you're going, wait a minute. You know? and, you're, and you're looking at the altar. Could be your coffin. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but you're looking at this altar at heart level. That's the point I want to make. And it's lit. And, there's, and so this darkness, back then when they made these grails, people didn't read. And so the Templars were out to give you a spiritual experience, even if you didn't read. So you come up to the center of the cathedral, and, you, and, and right below you is the crypt with a black or white Madonna. Isis is a black one. A lot of them are brown. They debate what happened. They, if they, were they all white and they turned brown and black and they all turned a little bit aged? But nonetheless, there is a virgin. And at first, it even looked like Isis, and there are many black ones, a lot of black ones still. The Notre Dame could be interpreted as the Black Madonna, actually, if you, to me, but other people say I'm wrong. But you, you have the, 
you have to look. Now, when you go down there, you could have a baby. <laughs> but this way, it's the virgin that you, you have some part of your soul that's still virgin, some part of ourselves that no one's gotten to. We haven't even gotten there because we don't know how to meditate or think or love in such a way. It's always, it's always easier to get it out of the other person or teach the other person rather than the teacher. It's very difficult. So then you, you have this idea. So that's where the Rosicrucians come in, is that the rose blooms at the heart of each one of us, this possibility. And of course, the rose comes up through the thorns, and then the rose blooms, and somehow the rose rises above these thorns. And it's a metaphor for many, many things. And uh, the ancient roses were five petaled. And when King Solomon, a triple sun name, so Solomon is a triple sun name, Om, S-O-L, O-M, Om, An, Egyptian sun god, the triple layer of the soul. And he says, I am the wisdom, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. And the roses are the source, scientifically, of all fruits and thus wine. And, and the lily is the source of all grains and thus bread. And so the idea of the bread and wine mysteries of Bakian, Dionysian, ancient Tibetan, goes way back, and the Christian mysteries of, of the body and blood, and bringing these together, the sun and moon somehow come together with us. As Rudolf Steiner points out, whenever you're studying spiritual things, these most abstract, dry things you have to be careful of, unless you remember who's looking. You have to apply them to our daily life and the sufferings. And this is what uh, the Rosicrucians, because everybody had been killed, the Rosicrucians come up with new ideas. First of all, it's all going to be inside of us if we don't have no meeting place because a lot of the meeting places back then were either the mountaintop or the cave. You go to the mountain for the quest and the vision quest. And you go to the mountain as a castle. And the Templars created chess. I can't believe I'm not getting to my notes, but I will in a minute. The Templars create chess because when you're back in these Middle Ages, especially the 9th and the 11th and 12th and into the 13th and 14th, actually. And the barbarians come, where are you going to go? Who are you going to call? The Ghostbusters? Where are you going to go when all the hell and the war happens? And the Templars are the guys who modernize chess as we know it. Because before that, there was chess, but you'd have like four teams, and they had all different kind of pieces. Templars come along and figured it out. And you have, and, and they're the origin of masonry. So all the masons have a black and white checkerboard square on their floor. And there's these great ideals that we have to transcend duality of salt and pepper and light and darkness. We have to transcend the dualities that we see because the pieces of chess are the consciousness. So you have the king and queen, you have the bishops, you have the knight, and you have the castles. The castles are the landlords. They have castles. So when the barbarians come and kill everybody and steal your stuff, you've got to get in a castle. And you've got to go for the landlord's castle or you have to go for the warrior's castle, or you have to go for the church. The bishop's castle oh, is a dangerous thing if you're a guy. Then you, then you have to go to the king and queen. And then the troubadours start messing stuff up, and they got in trouble for this, because they started to say that you can kiss anybody you want, if out of freedom or love. And you can marry anybody you want. And, and as Joseph Campbell points out, oh, this is a real gift of the troubadours that come along that before this, they, that you were a serf. You, were, uh, uh, you, you had to marry who they told you to marry and have babies and get more people to work on the farm. So you have what happens in the 11th century and 12th century, besides the grail and the troubadours, uh, you have this thing where all of a sudden you can own land. Like the king will go, I like you, you've been really good, you're free. I'm, I'm gonna give you some land, I own it, but you can work it, man, and you can marry whoever you want, and you can kiss whoever you want, and you have to give me tithing or taxes. This is where it all starts up. Although Godfrey Higgins in the Anaclipsis has quite an argument uh, for the fact that after Atlantis sunk and the people who survived Atlantis, who were really smart, they kind of became the new dictators and would immediately subjugate people to be their slaves without them knowing it. So then, then you have this idea of entering the cathedral and you come to the center, and I think that that's where the real spiritual experience is. You don't have to go to the altar. Even when I was a young theosophist, they would tell me that you go up to the altar and the priest comes from the other side of the altar. The invisible uh, spiritual person comes to meet us as a representative of our own higher self. The prodigal son story, 
that if you'll meet them halfway, if you'll just come pick yourself out of the animal nature, Rudolf Steiner said once, is everything eating and drinking? That's what he said once. And he was putting down these guys who were getting drunk too much and eating too much, and he was having trouble getting the message across during the agriculture lectures. And, um, um, but yeah, a lot of it is. And uh, the grail is that you can nourish, you can find nourishment that would nourish all your bodies. So the church became the sacred place of the Holy Mother, and they had the Virgin underneath, and the church hated this. And they often destroyed the labyrinths because you had to overcome your animal nature and you had to use your thinking. And the thing about Chartres Cathedral, I don't have enough time to go into it, but there's some really beautiful uh, labyrinths. You don't get lost. The whole thing with Chartres Cathedral is like the Tolkien Lord of the Rings. You just got to keep going. That's the whole secret of life. You just got to keep going. Nobody gets lost in the long run. So when you go into Chartres Labyrinth, you go round and round, you get to the center, and then you come back and you're back. And then you go up to the center, and then you have this experience. And I think you have this experience. Like, see, color, when you understand color theory, color theory comes about from the darkness and light. The rainbows appear when dark and light meet co-creatively. And that's where the rainbow happens. So in the church, you would get darkness. And the, see, the Templars, they want to make sure you didn't miss the experience. They put stained glass windows in there. So you have this all oh, dark and everything. And there were no chairs. You didn't sit down. Everybody stood. And nobody understands what they did there. And I want to just say that I think it's all when you stand at the center of yourself and you stand at the center of the temple that you have this experience of the below and the above and the right and left, and you're standing on the cross. By the way, the Templars were accused of standing on the cross and that they didn't accept Jesus as the only guy and they didn't take communion. They took the word. They took the spirit of the universal spirit that permeated everything with love and truth. And they lived that life, and that was their communion every day. And every day, the Knights of the Grail had to, they, you could only rest in the same place once, and you had to keep going until you found the Grail. That would nourish all of us. And when you get to the Grail, you have to ask the question, who does this serve? And by the end of the Parsifal Grail mystery, the Mary Magdalene uh, country, and, and she's redeemed, and, there's, and all the women get redeemed, and in and, and the grail mysteries, a virgin carries in the grail, and this idea of the virgin is uh, predominant again and again. Now, my friend Chris Fester always comes with a book that nobody's seen, The Secret Doctrine, Waltzburg Manuscript. We're just taking a little advertisement moment. I bet you don't know what this is. Okay, so that is for those students here. here. And if, have you seen that book before? There you go. <laughs> Another reason to come to the Mayflower Bookshop. He did it again. It's really hard to sell books, by the way, at my age and how long I've been there for 42 years. And it's really, really hard to sell books that uh, a lot of the people are in this room. <laughs> <laughs> so Sophia, so is like S-O, you know, like it means Old English and German. And it means in this way, therefore. You know, like go this way, so therefore. In this way, therefore, and there's more to it. And when you get to Sophia, the fee is uh, in ancient Egypt in many places, it was the golden mean and uh, related to the pyramid. So when you have Sophia, uh, uh, you have this, this idea of a go this way toward the golden mean of uh, harmony. And uh, the fee also meant an Italian saintly, saintly woman. This is one of the pictures, by the way, of uh, Sophia. One for all, all for one, unity and diversity. One is the I am, and the awe is Sophia. So Sophia is, like in the Kabbalah, you have the, the higher triad of Atma Buddha Manas, Brahma Vishnu Shiva. In Rudolf Steiner's early book I mentioned, he says that Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva is the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, not a ghost. And for many of us, it became a ghost. But, it, but he says that, and other places, other people, I won't mention your name again, but they said that's not true, but Steiner said it was. And so, but the difference, the problem with Sophia is there's the fallen Mary Magdalene. There's the, and there's people I meet that are proud of this. They want to be Mary Magdalene. Would you, can I be your Mary Magdalene? No. You know, stuff like that. Or, and so we all feel like we've, we're whoring ourselves for something or we're, 
we're like have to do something we don't want to do, and we have to do it so we can pay the bill, and, we, and like like that, you know, or you got to get make a coffee, or whatever you know we do, and so so you might say that Sophia is all these things, and there's nothing wrong as long as you're in touch with the whole, uh, the whole of it, and so when it comes, Sophia is known to be uh, the silence. There's only God. There's the one without another. The ultimate. Blavatsky talks about it. The rootless root. The pointless point. But there's a silence that ponders it. Like we, if we did it right, you know, if I was really, if I was really a teacher rather than just a fellow student trying to share some things, then I would say something and we'd all go, you know, we'd have different stages of silence. Now, those are the great teachers. They say something and you're going, then 10 years later, you know, glad I saw you. I just figured it out. <laughs> Norm did it to me just last year. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure him out. Okay, so, so you have like God, you have God, but you have silence. And then you have this idea of uh, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, maybe, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Then you have this idea that the Son, uh, before we get there, there's a lot of people, and again, I'm, I'm jumping here and I apologize. But if you work with this idea, you might like it. Um, uh, we've heard of Blavatsky loving the book Woman Clothed with the Sun. She, the most quoted book in the Secret Doctrine, the most quoted book in the Secret Doctrine, which is the major foundation stone of theosophy, although we could argue Isis and Veil is a lot easier to read and more fun, and it builds up to the whole thing. And Blavatsky herself said it's all one book. She's it was getting too big, and she put out ISIS and kept going. There's other things we could say about the difference. ISIS unveiled. ISIS is the Sophia, right? And how do you unveil it? So Sophia, the woman clothed with the sun that you see in the apocalypse, and you see referenced by the number one book quoted in the Secret Doctrine is uh, the finding of the uh, the perfect way. The Finding of the Christ by Anna Kingsford. And she has a second popular book called Woman Clothed with the Sun. Sophia is wisdom. They all tell you it's wisdom. But it's also, uh, I mean, what is wisdom is, is something we're, try, we're going to try to get at. But she's the woman who's clothed with the sun. Light is her raiment. She's wisdom and she's knowledge. And she very well may have been here first. And she drops down, and then when Christ comes to the sun, then we have, so Sophia is, is associated with the seven Elohim and, and is intimately connected to um, AA. I'm fooling some of you. Angels and archangels, it's AAA, and archai. She's like especially connected to that, but then she even falls into the earth, into the fire, earth, air, and water. And again, we have a physical, emotional, and mental, and a thinking, feeling, and willing that's enmeshed in sensory perceptions. And we don't, haven't really awoken a spiritual sixth sense or possible seventh sense of divine will. And so the Sophia has fallen into uh, ma matter in a way and sense-bound thinking. And so, so there is uh, this wonderful vision of Mary Magdalene and the Virgin Vestal, whatever, at the temple. And you have this idea of the woman who can recognize the Christos or the hero and um, uh, the one that, that is coming from the heart. And so the Christ is really the Christos of 500 B.C. around and the Krishna of ancient India. And the Christos is the attempt of the descent of the second person of the Holy Trinity, the, uh, the, the Om, the Om. Sometimes the Om is just like that. So if you've followed my teachings on Pantanjali's yoga aphorisms, then you know that you know, when, that, when I make this symbol here, you have the zero. You have the zero, and the silence or the emptiness 
or the space in the room that holds us, space in our hearts and minds, that spiritual soul that holds something. And then you have the Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost transforming the thinking, feeling, and willing. And when you read Rudolf Steiner's book on Theosophy and you compare that, the key to Theosophy, with Blavatsky, um, you can see this idea that there's a higher trinity transforming the lower trinity, but there's also something that's always holds still within us. And so at first, the divine, holy Sophia is the silence of God, but then she becomes um, the great goddess of ever change, and she is the wisdom behind the angels, archangels, and archai, and the exousiae, and the curiotites, and the dominions, is that right? And and the spiritual hierarchies, which I'd hope to have a piece of paper to give to you, but maybe next time. And, and she's actually in charge of these six or seven. And then she has this third fallen state. So when you see the zero, then you see the M in Om, like Om Cafe. And the M is really like a three. I'm, I'm saying that. So you have the three higher and the three lower. You see, something like that. <laughs> and uh, I think this is part of the secret of uh, Sophia, is that she was on the sun and operated this whole range of things. And then there was a, a further fall that is, uh, I actually am prepared, but we don't have the time, to walk into of, of when, what happened in that further fall. But, there's the fall of the angels from heaven. There's the fallout from the Garden of Eden. Um, and there's Cain and Abel, of, of which um, the male and female separate. And the, the, you think of it like that, you know. And uh, the etheric and the astral are kind of a war. And, or is it the physical and the etheric? I mean, we could talk about that, but we don't have time. And so then we go into the idea that the ego is over-identified with the physical, emotional, mental. And you've got to get up. You have to transcend. Now, some people just want to ascend to the ascended masters. And they haven't really thought it out. They haven't stood at the center where the fifth is. Uh, and that is a time period that we're in now is the attempt. We're, we're at a time period since around 1413, I think. Consciousness so starts then, I think. But a lot of people debate it as a little bit of a giveaway. And um, before that, you had to purify your feelings to have a direct experience, which you could do with the Templars and the Rosicrucians. And um, you could go to the cave and the mountain, or uh, you could be a good shepherd. You could be the Magi following the star. You could be the good shepherd of holy feelings and taking care of the little ones to find your way to the Christos or the heart. And uh, the, the sun at the center of this interesting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and this interesting right and left pillar with a center pillar. You come in, you go to the labyrinth of the moon in Chartres, and then you get to the center where there's, it opens up and there's a higher and lower, there's a virgin below. When you think about you're trying to give birth, when your will energies and your lower third of your body are giving birth to the goddess with the uh, Mary with the child or Isis with the child. It's a different experience. And, and you're thinking of the star you're following over your head. And, uh, and you're thinking of, of Om or, or Ein Sol. Um, there's a lot of words that we could use. So this is where we're trying to get. And one of my theories of Kabbalah has always been that the higher worlds are trying to descend to the lower worlds, and the lower worlds are trying to ascend to the higher worlds. And this is where the heart is capable of thinking, and they discovered neural cells, and the heart is, is actually capable of thinking and figuring stuff out. And so uh, I go to a lot of effort to help people to breathe into their heart and have their perception empty to their heart and be still long enough to wait for the heart to have a new conception of what's going on. And so if we can't go to our heart, we're stuck with a booby prize of headbound thinking and reflections. And um, the great goddess is known as a mirror, too. And so whether the great goddess is the mirror that holds all these together, or she's the silence, 
she can reappear and appear in Persephone um, and in Nana. You know, 4,000, 3,500 BC, before that, there are these Sumerian, Assyrian, Babylonian mysteries of this chick, this amazing woman who, for some reason, goes down into the underworld. Now, in the future, I'm going to have my 450-page astrology book will be separated so that you can get the goddess material, including Inanna and Persephone. But briefly put, because Psyche, I have the big story of Psyche and Eros, and Eros is the higher self, and Psyche is the soul or the mind, and finally your mind finds the beloved higher self, and you have this beautiful little while, and then because of your doubt and your anger and your weirdness and your knives, and this is a story that's in the book of Cupid and Psyche, and then, and then and you light this candle because your sister said that he's evil and he's an animal, and then it's a really great story about what we all do to ourselves. And, and so then Eros has to go back to heaven, the Lady Venus. And Psyche, the position we're in as the prodigal son, uh, is that, or in this case, the daughter. And this is a great thing about Inanna and Persephone, is that they're pre-Christian uh, women and the feminine wisdom that, that dies and goes into the underworld to save mankind. Because we have Prometheus and a bunch of guys, Hercules rather than her. Her Heracle There's, there could have been a female version of this earlier and her we have mostly guys Prometheus he brings he feels sorry for humanity Zeus is going to kill everybody because the human beings keep screwing up and making each other suffer and there's too many wars and Zeus says pretty soon they're going to get to heaven and they're going to wreck our party not only can they not come to the party I'm going to destroy all of them and Prometheus says no and Bavosky goes into a huge thing about this and in the secret doctrine, I looked for the quote because I wanted to amaze you again. I've quoted it before. It's an astounding quote, and I couldn't find it. And I will find it. It's an astounding quote that the divine feminine, before that, before that, and before that, and before that, the divine feminine fell from heaven and came to earth out of compassion. And the kind church fathers called her Satan. Babatsky says this. Who is Satan? And so uh, it's a Prometheus. Prometheus feels sorry for humanity, and he steals the fire of the gods, the golden goose, the jack and the beanstalk. And he comes down, and he shares the knowledge. And for his crime, he's like tied to a rock. And, and a big black bird comes and eats out his liver every day, and he keeps regenerating. Nobody can understand it, how he keeps coming back. It's a really great story. But the women's story are even more incredible. They're way cooler, and they have much more love and compassion. And they, they, nobody, and, and you got to understand that kings and queens and churches killed and destroyed all the cathedrals mostly, you know? I mean, they were just whacking everybody, and they were burning all the books. Like Hitler would burn all the books. They didn't want you to remember, and he was going to rewrite history. And it's a sad thing, and we're very, very lucky to have the secret doctrine and ISIS unveiled and, and the people that came out of those books. We're very lucky. Because there's been countries that you, you were arrested if you had those books. So it's very fortunate that we can even attempt to be spiritual. So Persephone is picking flowers and enjoying the colors, and she's with Artemis and, and, uh, Artemis and Athene, Athena in one story. And she, she gets bit in the heel, and Hades comes and steals her and drags her into the underworld. And she goes into the underworld, and she becomes, Persephone becomes queen of the underworld. And Heracles, Hercules and Dionysius and other guys will go down there to ask her for favors. Psyche goes down to ask for favors. So we hear that Pluto raped her and stuff. Maybe, maybe he was ravishing her with love. Marion Williamson, the great Jungian psychologist, goes into this. It depends on what level we're at and what story gets told. But basically, the point I'm making is in all the great legends, she's the queen of the underworld. And then Demeter, Ceres, the mother, she gets bummed out, and she goes to this, the king of Ephesus and takes care of their kid, and she keeps putting him into fire to make him immortal. She's going, I'm going to teach them. I'm going to teach them the secrets of immortality. And then the mother comes down by accident and sees that Demeter, the great mother, 
probably associated with one of these, but could be up here. Maybe if they get around. The mother comes in and says, oh my God, my kid's in the fire. So she pulls him out and she says, these ignorant people on, on earth, they don't know who the good and bad guy is. That's what she says. She says, they can't tell good from evil. They're idiots. I was teaching them the teachings of immortality, the fire of love and truth. And so then she just stops the process and leaves and goes back and says, okay, that's it. The whole earth is going to become a wasteland. Sound familiar with the Grail stories? The whole earth is going to become a wasteland until the goddess who has descended into the underworld means that we have jobs, we have babies, we try to have lovers, we go to work. Until that goddess gets to come back up and be happy all the time at the sun place where all the gods hang out, you know, or higher if you want, I'm, the whole earth is going to become a wasteland. And everybody's freaking out. They can't make wine. There's always really cool things they say they can't do anymore. They can't have fun. Women don't want to go to bed with guys and stuff. That is an old story. You know, in Greek times, they stopped the war as soon as all the women got together and stopped going to bed with anybody going to war. So I didn't want to get lost. So finally, they say, okay, you can come out. So they go down, and they tell Persephone she can come out. And Hades is so in love with her, he tricks her into eating a pomegranate. Pomegranates are red, blood, the mysteries of blood the metabolic, and multiplicity. Remember, Sophia is always related to everybody. The God, he's getting pissed off. The oneness doesn't care about. God is no respecter of persons. 